Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever in the world you might be joining us from. My name is Safwan Masri. I am Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. Our webinar today, The Great Vaccine Race, Perspectives from Brazil and the World, is part of a unique initiative by Columbia University and the Global Centers to offer programming resources and support to our international students during this unprecedented time. The topic, however, is relevant to all of us, students and non-students alike. The latest news regarding vaccine development have brought some hope, a scarce commodity since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. US research efforts succeeded in bringing to market at least two vaccines, produced with the latest technology and proven to be effective against the virus. Other vaccines produced in the UK, China, and Russia are already in widespread use. A number of other vaccines, including one from Johnson & Johnson, will soon be introduced into the global supply chain. Confidence is on the rise that the worst days of this pandemic could soon be behind us. While we have reason to celebrate these latest developments on the vaccine front, questions of daunting immunization logistics and glaring global inequities in access to the vaccine weigh heavily on our hopes for a balanced global recovery. Moreover, dangerous new virus strains have appeared in South Africa, the UK and Brazil, each of these potentially undermining the effectiveness of the current generation of vaccines. Focused on the science of vaccine development, governments worldwide failed to plan adequately for the vaccine rollout phase, currently underway in fits and starts. The program has been bogged by logistical challenges, including limited vaccine production capacity and the need for expensive refrigeration equipment for the two leading vaccines. Global inequities in vaccine access are glaring with the wealthier countries rushing to purchase vaccine supplies, leaving the middle income and poorer countries of the world to fend for themselves. Countries representing 16% of the world's population have purchased 60% of the global vaccine supply, and they stand ready with their financial resources to increase this share. Just look at the situation in Israel-Palestine, where Israel has led the way in vaccinating its population and is sitting on huge quantities of vaccines that it had overordered, while 5 million Palestinians under occupation, many of whom work or study in Israel, do not have access to vaccines. Finally, as if these problems were not enough, many countries have had woefully inadequate public health policies. In the US and elsewhere, governments unwilling to bear the political costs of lockdowns and similar preventive measures resorted to minimizing the health risks of the COVID-19 virus, even spreading misinformation about spurious vaccine treatments and deliberately undermining public confidence in the new vaccines. Today's webinar proposes to take on some of these big issues in the face in the race for the vaccine by addressing the science and practicality of the rollout. We are pleased to welcome some of Columbia University's leading experts on global dimensions of the virus to enlighten and instruct us. Subsequently, our guest this morning will turn to the perplexing case of Brazil. Despite Brazil's well-regarded public health services and admirable scientific institutions, the country has suffered from COVID-19 in disproportionate measures. Thus far, close to 250,000 Brazilians have died from COVID. This tragic toll surpasses every country except that of the United States, and new cases remain at near record levels. Hospital systems are completely overwhelmed in the worst hit urban areas. And all major cities in Brazil are ringed by sprawling favela communities where the virus has been particularly devastating. But COVID is not only an urban problem in Brazil. The more remote regions of the country have been badly battered as well. It is difficult to fathom how this came to be the state of affairs in a middle-income nation with an otherwise functional public health system. Our hope is that a comprehensive understanding of the Brazilian experience will help illuminate and perhaps ameliorate 
the problems facing other middle and low income countries around the world, particularly with respect to disastrous public policies and global inequities in access to the new vaccines. Here this morning to help us address these issues from global perspectives and from the viewpoint of Brazil are a number of noted experts, including today's moderator, Dr. Judy Kornfeld. Professor Kornfeld is Vice Provost for Academic Programs and Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University's Mainman School of Public Health. Julie is an expert in pedagogic innovations and professional training for public health leaders. Prior to her work with Columbia University, she served as Assistant Dean of Public Health at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where she launched the nation's largest integrated four-year dual degree in medicine and public health, a program that gives graduate physicians the skills to solve the complex problems facing local and global communities. Julie, it is with pleasure that I turn it over to you to introduce our wonderful panelists and to get the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you, Safwan. Very great introduction and very excited to jump into the presentation. So um, our format for today, um, Dr. El Sadir, who's a professor, university professor of epidemiology and medicine here at Columbia and the founder and director of ICAP will begin and give us a big, um, an overview of, of the global vaccine development and distribution. And then we're gonna turn to our three panelists with expertise, deep expertise in Brazil. Um, and they will each give a commentary um, based uh, to follow Dr. El Sadir's um, presentation presentation. I'll, I'll turn to each of you after uh, Dr. El Sadir's presentation. And then we will have question and answers. So I encourage our audience and our participants, please go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A and we will answer them as we have time at the end of the um, presentation. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. El Sadir and then I will um, come back and turn to our panelists. Well, thank you very much, uh, Safwan, and thank you, Julie, and bon dia, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the screen, Julie? Okay. So I'm going to do a very brief uh, update on the COVID-19 vaccine uh, and, and a bit of some touching on some of the important issues relating to the vaccine itself, as well as to vaccination programs. So just uh, to start, I think to give you a, a snapshot of where we are in terms of the global pandemic, there now uh, have been reported more than 111 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and this is a way underestimate because as you are well aware, uh, testing for COVID is not widely available in some countries. And more than 2.4 million people have died uh, from COVID-19. Just yesterday, the US reached half a million deaths uh, from COVID-19. Now, when we look at by region, uh, what's interesting is that the vast majority of cases that have been reported thus far have been reported from the Americas, North America and South America, as well as from the European region. And then if you look at this map on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see that COVID-19 has really touched every country in the world. Uh, but the top five reporting countries include the US followed by India, Brazil, uh, Russia, and the United Kingdom. And this has been the order of, um, uh, for the past several months. And actually for many, many months, the US has been leading in terms of reporting the largest numbers of COVID-19 cases. Now, what's important about the virus? The epidemic has been evolving over the past several months, now almost a year. And as the virus is uh, multiplies and is transmitted and multiplies, these kinds of viruses, the coronaviruses, and this virus particularly, SARS-CoV-2, makes mistakes as it multiplies. And as it makes these mistakes, it creates what we call mutations. And these mutations create what we call new virus variants. So for example, you can see in this figure here, uh, that some of these mutations, some of these errors as the virus is multiplying, result in changes in the spike protein up here, the top part of the virus. And this is the part of the virus that latches onto the receptor in our bodies. So as these changes happen in this protein, uh, this can influence uh, the, a lot of different things. It can influence how transmissible the virus is. It can also influence potentially how deadly the virus is and may also influence in terms of uh, the ability of the virus to outsmart our treatments and vaccines. You are probably aware there's several uh, variants that have been very prominent in the media. 
uh, of concern, the one isolated from the United Kingdom, uh, the one from South Africa, the one from Brazil, and there's several variants that have been isolated in the United States as well. So let's move on to a vaccine update. The good news is that there's a very robust pipeline in terms of vaccine development. And we know that there are now about 37 uh, different vaccine candidates that are in phase one of research. And phase one is the very first uh, test in humans. And this is largely to determine whether these facts, this vaccine candidate is safe. There are 28 uh, candidates now that are in phase two. These are larger studies to determine largely the safety of these vaccine candidates. There are 20 in phase three, and this is the final phase, large studies uh, that determine whether the vaccine actually works and whether it is safe in large numbers of individuals. Based on these studies, we have four vaccines that have been fully approved for use. Now here is a list of the status of leading vaccines. You can see that we are very fortunate in there are several vaccines now there are available in various parts of the world. In the US, the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are the ones that are in use now. And these use a technology called the mRNA technology, a new technology for production of vaccines. But there's several other vaccines, uh, the Jamalaya Sputnik V from Russia, the Oxford AstraZeneca, and two Chinese, uh, uh, two vaccines made in China, as well as Johnson & Johnson, Novavax. So the good news is there are several vaccines either that have been approved or underway to approval or in large studies, and also that they work through different ways, that they're, they're produced in different ways, which is good, which means that uh, some individuals, for example, who may not be able to tolerate one kind of vaccine can receive a different type of vaccine. I'm gonna walk quickly through the vaccines that are most prominently available. I'll start with the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the Moderna vaccines, and they're very similar. They're both mRNA vaccines, like I mentioned. They're highly effective in these phase three studies. They were shown to be 95% and 94% uh, effective, which is ex very, very good news. There also have not been any serious safety concerns that have been reported. Most commonly, the side effects have been local at the injection site and mild to moderate. None have been severe. And both of these require two doses uh, for vaccination. Now I've highlighted here in yellow some of the concerns with these new variants. So you can see that in experiments in the laboratory uh, that there was a, there's a, a lowering in the amount of antibodies. This is the produced by the immune system in the body, a lowering of the amount of protective antibodies against the South Africa variants by six times and also twofold decrease against the UK variant. Similar findings were also noted uh, with the uh, Moderna vaccine as well. Uh, although, even though this has been noted in the, in the laboratory, it is believed that probably the antibody levels may remain protective against uh, these vaccine variants, these virus variants. Now, two other vaccines that are important are the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine and this is the only vaccine thus far uh, that's been developed that actually uh, uses only one dose. So that's really important from a practical perspective. Uh, this uh, vaccine has been studied in various parts of the world in large study of 444,000 people. And uh, what it showed is 72% efficacy in the United States, 66% in Latin America, and 54% in South Africa. And it's been shown though across the board that it appears to be protective against severe COVID-19 disease. Now the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has also have been shown to be overall about 70% effective, uh, but you can see a gradient in efficacy, 90% in the UK, about 62% in a study in Brazil, and only 10% efficacy against the South Africa variant. So you're seeing a, a trend here that these vaccines appear to be, based on these studies, to be less effective against the South Africa variant in particular. The good news, again, no serious side effects with either of these vaccines, apart from the mild to moderate ones that I mentioned before. There are also other vaccines, another one called Novavax, also studied in large numbers, 15,000 individuals with about 4,400 in South Africa, and again, the same phenomenon of 80. 89% efficacy in the United Kingdom, but 49% efficacy in South Africa. 
and uh, again, no serious side effects. Now, the Sputnik V vaccine produced in Russia have all, has also published results, highly effective at 94% with no serious side effects and two, uh, requiring two doses. And lastly, I'll touch base on the two uh, vaccines that are produced in, in China because I, I believe that Brazil is also using the Sinovac vaccine. And these use inactivated virus uh, as, a, as a way of producing the vaccine. And again, you can see the efficacy here between 79 and 86% for Sinopharm, and between 50 to 78% with Sinovac. And again, importantly, no serious side effects have been noted with either of these, and uh, both of them require two doses. So the trend we're seeing is that these are appear to be safe vaccines. The efficacy varies from one vaccine to the next, and we appear to be seeing a gradient, a consistent gradient, with the studies that have been done more recently uh, where uh, they've been studied against the South Africa variant with some compromise of the efficacy of these vaccines against that variant. So let's talk about vaccine equity now. So this is uh, what's been uh, what's been uh, known for a while now is um, is the disparity in terms of the uh, purchasing or securing of doses of the vaccine by country and entity. You can see here again uh, this is uh, uh, numbers of, of doses of the vaccine here on the y-axis and some of the country and the entity names on the uh, on, on the, this is x-axis on the y-axis. You can see that the European Union, for example, has purchased. Uh, secured uh, large numbers of doses, initial doses, followed by the U.S. COVAX is an initiative uh, between the Gavi and WHO uh, with the goal of providing vaccines uh, or purchasing and procuring vaccines for low middle income countries. And the African Union has also been engaged as well in uh, securing or attempting to secure vaccines for African countries. And then you can see that the majority of the uh, then, uh, to a much lesser extent, other countries have been working on uh, trying to secure some of these vaccines. And you can see here Brazil right here, uh, again, with, uh, with the uh, Moderna Pfizer vaccine, AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as other vaccines that have been ordered uh, by the country. And then you can see, of course, there's a, a very big disparity that's been noted. And, um, and you can see in these colors here that the high income countries, again, in the, the biggest bar here in terms of the numbers of doses that have been purchased uh, by high income countries versus uh, upper middle income, lower middle income, and low income countries. And then by COVAX, you can see here in the gray. So we are beginning to see this disparity noted uh, between different countries, different regions of the world in terms of access uh, to the vaccine itself. And then in terms now, let's beyond the purchasing and, and procurement of the vaccine, of course, the most important thing is next step is vaccinating people. It's very important to have vaccines, but ultimately vaccines don't do anyone any good sitting in freezers or refrigerators. It is the vaccination program. It's getting the vaccines into uh, the arms of people who need to be vaccinated that matters the most. And this map shows the global vaccination per 100 persons. And you can see, again, uh, similar to what I uh, mentioned before, is that the darkest blue are uh, countries that have the highest rates of vaccination per 100 person. And again, you can see the darkest blue, the United States, and, you can, and Western Europe as, as two examples, and then other countries uh, with lighter colors of blue. But of course, there's a glaring uh, disparity that's immediately notable, which is, of course, the continent of Africa, where uh, very few, uh, if any, people have been vaccinated thus far. There's the beginning of some vaccination in South Africa for healthcare workers, but that's about it. And then on the right-hand side, you see also the rates of vaccinations, again, per 100 persons. And as was mentioned by Safwan, Israel has been uh, leading in terms of vaccinating uh, some of its populations followed by the UAE, the UK, the United States, and, and other countries here, as you can see in the list. And you can see Brazil here at 3.27 uh, vaccinations per 100, indivi per 100 individuals. Now, what about vaccination intentions and impact? I always say that whatever you have, any intervention, whether it be in medicine or, uh, or a vaccine, in order to achieve the desired impact, uh, from this vaccine, in this context we're talking about vaccines, you need two things. You need efficacy, you need something that works well. And we're very fortunate to have some of these vaccines are very highly efficacious. 
that's really important. That's a, a very important prerequisite. But another prerequisite is coverage or uptake, which means the number of people who have received the vaccine. And that's really important. We, need to, we, will, we are not gonna achieve the impact of these vaccines without achieving sufficient uptake and coverage by these vaccines. And it's important to also realize it's not just the total number of people to be vaccinated, but who gets vaccinated. Because from a public health perspective, you need to vaccinate the people most at risk most vulnerable, where there's most of the transmission happening, they need to be vaccinated first so you can actually decrease the transmission of the virus. As well as, of course, in order to protect people at higher risk of complications of COVID-19. So coverage is very critical, but also equity in coverage is very critical because you want to reach those who are most vulnerable to infection and those who are most vulnerable to complications first. But ultimately, you want to achieve the highest possible coverage with efficacious vaccine in order for us to achieve population immunity or the impact of these vaccines. Now, there is a continuum in terms of vaccine acceptance, and this is a topic that has received a lot of attention. And this is the continuum. You have on one end people who are convinced that if asked the question, uh, if, the, if, if we had a vaccine, if you were offered a vaccine today, would you take it? And these are the people on this end of the continuum who say absolutely. And what we need to do is for individuals who are poised to act is to make it as simple, as easy as possible to get vaccinated. We have to make it to do away with all the barriers, linguistic barriers, cultural barriers, geographic barriers, economic barriers. We have to, to really try to address all of these so that we can get people vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. And then in the other end, there are people refusing. These are people who refuse vaccines. They may not believe in vaccines at all. And, uh, and these are the anti-vaxxers, uh, have been called anti-vaxxers. But I think most people really often sit in the middle here. They, they are taking this wait and see approach. And it is our incumbent among all of us uh, who are engaged in public health and so on and health overall, is to provide the answers to these individuals, to provide the answers to their questions, to their concerns, to identify the champions from their communities so that they can uh, talk to them in a trusted manner and gain their trust so that they feel comfortable, they feel that they are ready to act. They're moving down this on this continuum and they're ready to act. So we have to tailor our intervention based on where people are at in terms of vaccine acceptance. You can see here on the right a survey that was done, and this survey asked the percent who agree or disagree, agrees in green, disagree as red, um, uh, that they would um, take COVID-19 vaccine if it was available. And you can see that Brazil is very good, um, in a very good spot. So that's really good news, is that uh, most people when asked these questions, they agree as that they would go and get the vaccine. But you can see the, the variability in different countries here across the world and point out Brazil at the top with 86% agree. And then down here, the United States with only 63% agree with doing so. I think what's important is to notice what's here on this side of the figure, which is that the change since December, we've noticed uh, thankfully a change and in, an increase in acceptance of vaccines uh, over the past uh, several months. And you can see here across the board, there's been an increase, although for some reason in this survey, there was a decrease in the United States and in a tiny decrease in, the, in, in South Africa. But nonetheless, it's encouraging to see that people are more willing to accept vaccines. So our task is really to make it as convenient as possible for those who are ready to be get, get vaccinated. And then for those who want more information, need somebody they trust to tell them about vaccines to work very hard to make that feasible for them. So I say that at this point in time, we in a race, we're in a race between this virus and the vaccines. It's a very important uh, moment. There's great, um, I think it's a, a moment of great optimism. I feel, I always say that uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the light is at the end of the tunnel, but we still have to walk through that tunnel to get to the light. And as we're walking through that tunnel, it behooves us to do two things, to do everything possible to decrease transmission of the virus as well as to, of course, uh, scale up vaccines. 
So like I said, there's good news in terms of the decrease in numbers of cases in the United States. That's been uh, noted recently, the decrease in, in the UK, the decrease in Europe, in Brazil, in other countries, even in South Africa, a decrease in numbers of cases. But at the same time, there's the concern about the evolution of these variants. So we have to try to stop every single transmission because every time the virus is transmitted and multiplies, it is going to make those errors. It is going to create new mutations. So in conclusion, uh, pandemic continues to grow and evolve. The vaccine development is moving along at a rapid pace, uh, but there is the need to expand vaccination uh, reach within countries. There are inequities in the, within countries as well as inequities between countries. And that applies to the United States, and I'm sure it also applies to Brazil as well. And I'm sure we'll talk about them. As the virus is transmitted and multiplies, these new variants appear, which may threaten the, uh, to outsmart our vaccines and treatments. And I want to end with that, even with vaccination, even with vaccination, we need for the foreseeable future to continue to observe the public health preventive measures we all know about for several reasons. One of them is the evolution of these new variants. Also, the protection from the vaccine is not immediate. There's no vaccine that's 100% effective. We don't know the duration of protection from these vac with these vaccines. We have very limited information, beginning to get information about whether the vaccine will prevent just an asymptomatic infection. Uh, all of the studies have measured uh, prevention of disease, but not infection. There's evolution of some data to tell us that it's preventing infection, but we have to wait and see. And of course, the, that the vaccine efficacy may be compromised by these new variants. So I, I end by saying that please, uh, when people ask me what they should do the day after they get vaccinated versus the day before they get vaccinated, I always tell them you continue to do exactly the same thing until we can walk through that tunnel and get to the end of the tunnel and hopefully the end of this pandemic. Thank you very much and I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Wafa, for an amazing presentation and a, a really comprehensive overview. Um, we're going to turn our conversation a bit to Brazil, and I'm going to turn first um, to Miguel Lago, who is um, the executive director for the Institute for Health Policy um, in Rio. And 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 Miguel, maybe um, you can help us to understand the situation, perhaps in Brazil, um, and maybe more broadly in Latin America. Um, we know the region is experiencing significant impact, um, yet seeing little availability of vaccine. Um, so perhaps you can orient us a bit. With pleasure, Judy. Well, th first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in this such amazing discussion. Unfortunately, I will need to leave a little bit earlier because I have my students at Columbia waiting for me in about uh, to uh, half an hour, uh, but I'm very, very glad to be here and, and listening uh, to this amazing presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, if we look to Latin America, one of the, my, my major, major, I think the major challenge we have in Latin America is, is that uh, inequality uh, is challenging immunization. Uh, so if you look at the, if you look at the region, um, so 25% of the, uh, the, the, death tolls uh, from COVID uh, in the region, in the region where uh, only 8% of the population lives. Uh, so uh, it has been extremely impacted by uh, uh, this pandemic more than other regions in the world. And um, inequality has been one of the, uh, the, the major reasons uh, for this to happen. I think uh, Latin America, when we look at the countries and there, of course, there's a lot of diversity inside and within Latin America. However, if we look uh, at, um, we have three constant uh, traps in Latin America, uh, not always uh, present in every country, but uh, certainly the one that is completely uh, across all the nations is uh, uh, structural inequality. So the first trap, I think it's structural inequality. The second one uh, is the fragility of health system, which is not the case uh, of Brazil, but it's the case of many of our uh, uh, Latin American countries. And, and finally, uh, poor leadership, uh, uh, which is the case in Brazil. Uh, so if we look, for instance, Peru, uh, who is a country that uh, took it really seriously uh, in March last year, they did a lockdown very quickly. Uh, they took it really, really serious, much more than European countries. Uh, but Peru did had a very fragile health system, uh, no state capacity to really afford um, paying for people to stay at home. Um, um, so 
uh, at the end, one year after, you can see that Peru uh, had, a, had a really hard time. Brazil also had a hard time. Brazil had the state capacity uh, to pay for people to stay at home. Uh, Brazil had uh, the, the state capacity of having a strong health system that could have been used, uh, but it had a poor leadership that was fighting uh, any kind of, of uh, rational or uh, scientific measure only for electoral reasons. Uh, so so, uh, so when, when, when the country uh, has a good leadership uh, uh, and a serious leadership, it gets trapped because of inequalities and the fragmented health systems. When uh, it has more solid health systems, what we have seen is that uh, uh, leadership has uh, simply uh, destroyed uh, this capacity. So um, going further, I think that looking at the vaccination, we still have the same kind of problems. Because of our fragile health systems, we don't have the capacity to develop those vaccines in our countries. Of course, Brazil is an exception uh, uh, when we are looking to the whole region. Uh, but still, um, uh, Brazil's, Brazil's capacity has been, has been challenged for the, for, for, for the, for the last year. So, uh, so, um, so this is the first uh, issue. So we're very dependent on COVAX. So, uh, which is the multilateral um, uh, commitment uh, to, to have uh, vaccines for every citizen. The problem with COVAX uh, is that the, the way that it's distributed is 3% of the population, of the general population of each country. So, for instance, a country like New Zealand has the same amount of vaccines as a country as Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica. Uh, so, uh, when, when uh, Costa Rica was... Uh, uh, had had an outbreak uh, much more serious than New Zealand and has not the same state capacity and the same conditions as New Zealand, as we all know. So, um, so the, first, the first challenge that I see here for Latin America is that we should absolutely uh, have a, a fair priority model uh, in order to, to have uh, a distributed justice around the COVAX. Uh, but Latin American countries that are dependent on COVAX uh, they, they, they need to uh, coordinate themselves and, and they need to, 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 to advocate for, for a fairer distribution um, um, with, with, uh, uh, together. And uh, we don't see uh, any country leading this situation. So, so uh, then we have the poor leadership here again. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the second, um, uh, the second uh, uh, challenge that I see uh, it's also when looking at the, the vaccination plans. So when we look at them, we see we, uh, when we look who is the priorities, who are the priority populations to be vaccinated, um, uh, we, we feel as we are in Europe or in the United States. Uh, so we're copying the same model of Europe or the United States when uh, we have, um, uh, we know that uh, we have other facts, uh, we have other uh, risks for populations uh, in those countries. So we know uh, that inequality uh, has, uh, ha has been a great ally of, of the virus in Latin America, and, uh, uh, and we need to include a socioeconomic um, uh, criteria also in the priority orders and the queue for the vaccination. It's, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, we, we, we cannot, it's not the same situation in Europe. Um, but it's the situation in Latin America, so so we should uh, sh should definitely embrace this as a criteria. Uh, so I, I I'm advocating uh, that um, in just summing up uh, that we need a, a regional coordination in order to advocate for a fa fair priority model um, uh, uh, as a region, as a whole region, uh, so that we have a, a more equitable COVAX distribution around the world. First. The second um, measure is that we, we absolutely need to adopt the same, uh, uh, the same logics, the same uh, equity logics uh, inside our countries uh, in the moment to when we vaccinate the people. So, and we're not seeing this happen. So, so this, this is something very important also to advocate for. But I'm just, th this was my main message and I'm happy to hear all my amazing uh, um, co-participants to, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. I, I'm going to turn next to um, Dr. Sylvia Martin, who's a professor of epidemiology here at Columbia at the Mailman School of Public Health. Um, 
Sylvia, Miguel talked a bit about inequity. Maybe you can talk a bit about vaccine prioritization um, in, within Brazil um, and approval processes within Brazil. You know, how is it that we, what, what are in the US and in Europe, we have seen very much a focus on, on vaccinating the elderly um, and those in nursing homes. I think Miguel made a case for the fact that inequities might um, justify a different just uh, prioritization. And maybe you can speak to that and, and a bit about approval access in, within Brazil. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you for inviting me to participate today. So, in in regards to in regards to the vaccination process in Brazil, as Miguel said, Brazil has the capacity and the infrastructure, and the infrastructure. Brazil has a, a strong public health care system, and the problems that are arising now are mainly due to lack of leadership. So Brazil has been offered um, has been offered ever since July of last year to make agreements with several different with several different pharmaceutical companies, but because of lack of leadership, it ended up like only 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 negotiating to get access to the vaccines that can later be produced in the country. So that is the Chinese vaccine Sinopharm CoronaVac. Which, which at first it was a state of Sao Paulo that was able to make the negotiations and make that a reality. And only later on the federal government agreed to buy it. And then also the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine that still ha uh, has just recently, the product has recently arrived in the country. So basically, basically Brazil is relying on those two vaccines. The approval uh, they have been approved. They have been approved for emergency vaccination, and the approval process is lengthy. is relatively lengthy. So Brazil's FDA and Visa ask for a lot of details. They have recently changed changed some of the requirements. So initially, they want like clinical trials, clinical trials conducted in the country and specific data, specific data uh, from clinical trials conducted in Brazil, which was also a hurdle. Uh, I just I just saw today earlier today in the news that they just approved the Pfizer vaccine. The, they just approved the Pfizer vaccine earlier today through regular approval, but it's still unknown whether the government is going to, whether the go government is going to have an agreement that is going to have access to Pfizer, to, to the Pfizer vaccine, especially because it has already been distributed and sold like to many other countries. So I would, I would imagine Brazil would be way back, way back in the line to get some of those vaccines. And then the matter of prioritization. So Brazil started its vaccination program about a month ago. So on January 17th in the state of Sao Paulo with a, with a Sinopharm vaccine to date they have vaccinated about 7.25 million people uh, seven, so they have vaccinated they have used like 7.25 million doses almost almost 6 million people have already been fully vaccinated o almost 6 million people have already received one dose almost uh, about 1.3 million people have been fully vaccinated but it has prioritized mainly healthcare workers healthcare workers and the elderly uh, and and it, it really and the elderly and really like in most places it's mainly people 85 and older that have received the vaccine the, uh, uh, that, that, that have received the vaccine some capitals depending on how much vaccine they have received have vaccinated older people but slightly elderly but slightly younger uh, they also have a prioritized vaccinating the indigenous population and quilombolas populations where, where people that are descendants from enslaved people that live in in separate in, in separate groups but there have uh, there have been there has been very little discussion about like let's put in the priority groups like essential workers uh, so for example a grocery store people working in grocery stores or or bus drivers bus drivers construction workers so people that are regularly in face-to-face -face with the public and also we know that as in the US like in Brazil uh, in Brazil people from low socioeconomic status have been harder hit by the virus and there there is yet no prioritization for that 
I know there ha has been some discussion of including also school teachers, so school teachers uh, as priorities, and that might be a reality from March onwards, but it's still, it, it's still something in flux and under discussion. So most of the kids in Brazil have been out, uh, due to the virus, have been out of school ever since March. And then there's also an inequity in that, that as of now, like a lot of private schools are, are going back like, to a hybrid model, but uh, in the public schools, that is not happening. And I think that uh, accelerating vaccination to teachers would help with that. So I think there needs to be more discussion. And that is also mainly due to lack of leadership at the federal level and clashes between leadership at the federal, the state, and the municipal level. Um, Brazil has the capacity to vaccinate more than a million people per day if they want to do it. The, the, it has like the all the infrastructure. It has the infrastructure once vaccines are available and once, once vaccines are produced locally. So we know that Instituto Butantan will be able to start producing locally the Sinopharm CoronaVac vaccine in, in after after July, so between August and September. September. But there are still several months for that, and and there there are new variants. Uh, there are new variants going around the country. So, if, if if things had been planned earlier, I think Brazil would be in a better position nowadays. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn now um, to uh, Dr. Rodrigo Suarez, who is. Um, a Lehman Professor of Brazil Public Policy here at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, Rodrigo, I, I, I think um, Dr. Martin spoke a bit about the National Health Service and the infrastructure, but perhaps you can talk a little bit more um, about the tension, particularly between federal and state and municipalities and how that's impacted the, va the vaccination plan across the country. Um, certainly we have seen that tension here in the US, but I believe it, I think it is playing out differently um, in Brazil. Um, in a country that that has a long and successful history of vaccination, um, in particularly around H1N1. So I'll, I'll turn to you to see if you can um, lend us some more insight there. Thank you, thank you, Julie, and thank you, Tom, for the for the invitation. It's great to be here. So I'm I'm going to try to address some of the points that Julie made. I'm going to get back to to some of the points that the other speakers touched upon as well. Uh, so let me just I mean start with a slightly broader perspective. I think it's obvious from 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 the news and from things that we, we've already discussed here, that the federal government in Brazil has done a very serious harm to the, to the response to the crisis, right? Part of it intentionally for ideological and political motivations, but I think also part of it out of just sheer incompetence, right? So I think there's the lack of management capabilities at the, at the top of the Ministry of Health is, is really staggering, right? So lack of initiative, lack of, of planning capacity, so there's no doubt that the response at the country level has been much worse than it could have been. Having said that, I think we have also to put things in perspective, right? I understand and, and I know it's very difficult to make comparisons across locations before the, the pandemic has actually ran its course in the different, in different places in the different countries. At the same time, just look at the aggregate numbers at the country level. I mean, does not, doesn't care, carry much meaning either, right? Because countries are of different sizes. So if you look today, I mean, in, in per capita terms, for instance, mortality in Brazil is still way below most of Western Europe, way below the US and Mexico, for instance, and uh, not very different from Argentina, Chile, and, and Colombia, right? So again, I mean, I think there's still a lot to play out. There is the fear of, of, of what the Br Brazilian variant is going to do in the country, there are issues of age, age composition differences across Brazil and the European Union. We, we really won't know how this is going to be until the end. But the fact that Brazil is not really an outlier right now in terms of, uh, of, of outcomes of the crisis. I think that the point is that Brazil could have been very likely a positive outlier in terms of having had a very good response as the country had during the HIV AIDS uh crisis right so this didn't happen either unfortunately and i think obviously the government's very much to blame but at the same time it's not really an outlier right now when we look at at outcomes right um so in some sense i think this reflects the fact that the the actual response in the country is not really what's portrayed in the president's speech or in the ministers of of, of health's speech right and i think this indeed has a lot to do with the, the unified health system that we've been talking about, right? So I think that the, the, 
despite everything, despite the major political efforts at the country level to, 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 to slow down the response, the system actually functions organic a little bit by, by itself, right? And, uh, and uh, obviously it could have been better, but it actually has done a lot by itself despite the, the negative influence at the, federal, at the federal level, right? And I think this is true of the, of the network of, of family health clinics, of the, of, the, of, the, of the exchange of information that is actually built into the system. This is true of the research institutes like Oswaldo Cruz and Butantan. And this has all happened, I mean, let's say beneath the, the outrageous claims that we hear from, 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 from our leaders, right? And something that has happened, and I, I, uh, we have already alluded to that as well, is that local governments, in particular states, actually have assumed the protagonist role in terms of the strategic planning of the response at the country level. That is really unprecedented uh, in previous uh, uh, in previous crises in the country. Like usually, we would have seen the federal government taking a leadership role, and obviously this was not the case. And I mean, I wonder whether this will have political implications in the future for Brazil in terms of really redefining the federalism and the, the relationship between the different uh, political actors at the at the country level. And I think, I mean, getting to the vaccination specifically, I think the vaccination is yet another manifestation of this overall story, right? There, is, there was complete inaction and lack of planning at the, at the, at the, at the federal level, a stalling of the vaccination program, no initiative whatsoever, uh, lack of understanding of the need for the diversification in terms of looking for different, different uh, vaccines and, and knowing that scarcity would be an issue in the future overall, just kind of a, 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 a very much a, a lack of, of the sense of urgency, right? And again, state governments, the independent public health institutes, local governments, and the private sector actually assumed this leadership role in a way that was, was also unprecedented. So the government, what it has done, it has been as a response to political pressure coming from these different actors, right? And But again, I mean, also in relation to vaccination, I think we have to put things in perspective, right? Because I think it does highlight the merits of the of the of the of the health system in Brazil. I mean, the, the issue of vaccination has been extremely challenging, I think, for most countries, with very few exceptions. We might say Israel and the UK, certainly. Maybe you might include US and Chile, for instance, on, on those. But if you consider the first dose, I mean, and I, I have numbers that are slightly different from, from Waffle's numbers, but I think mine are outdated a little bit, probably a couple of days, but I think it tells more or less the same story, right? So I think this was at the end of last week, Brazil had vaccinated 2.8% of the population. The average at the European Union at that day, when I checked, was actually 3.9% of the population. Argentina, Colombia, and Mexico were actually below 1%, right? And this is actually kind of surprising because Brazil started considerably later than all of these, right? And I think this goes back exactly to the same points that, that I mentioned before, and I think Sylvia also mentioned before, related to the capacity that is already built into, into the unified health, health, health system, right? And, and uh, that's why I think that moving forward, I don't, don't want to extend myself, so just to conclude, I think moving forward, I think there are some reasons to expect that Brazil will do relatively well. And when I mean relatively well, I mean in comparison to other middle-income countries, right? I think the challenges are not going to go away very, very quickly. But I think historically, Brazil has been, I mean, during the polio, historical polio immunization campaigns, Brazil has vaccinated 10 million children a day, right, in certain circumstances. I think recurrently during the H1 and 1 vaccination campaigns, the country vaccinates 80 million people in three months, right? The system is already built, it's, it's ready, it's operational. In some sense, you really just have to press the, uh, the button, right? Uh, I think there are tens of thousands, 35, 50, 40,000 uh, vaccination centers that are readily uh, set up. So the challenge is really the access to the vaccines, right? I think in, also in this respect, since at least, as I understand, at least three, because I think the, the Russian vaccine also is going to be produced locally, uh, since at least three of these vaccines are going to be produced locally, I think there is also some, 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 some chance that actually we may respond better than our, our peers, let's say, right? I think the issue is really scarcity. And that not, I think for, in the case of Brazil, I don't think it's, it's in the near future, I guess, probably over the next month, 
It's not going to be an issue of scarcity of, of, of the vaccines themselves anymore. It's going to be an issue of the uh, scarcity of inputs, right? Inputs for production. I'm not, I mean, I, 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 I try to read about that. I don't know how much, how, how easier, if this actually makes life much easier or not, if the inputs are going to be as hard to find as the, as the vaccines. Uh, but I, but I, 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 I do think that we, Obvious, it's, it's entirely obvious that we could be in a much better position and that everything that the federal government has done since the beginning of the crisis has been to undermine the response. Nevertheless, I think we, we hopefully maybe are going to be in a, in a decent position when, when, when we, we get access to, to inputs and are able to actually start really, really rolling it out, right? But I Again, there, I think there are lots of uncertainties. There's still the variant going around that I don't think we understand fully uh, what's going to be the impact of that. Uh, so obviously, the level of uncertainty is extremely high. So let me stop here. And thank you again for the, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, really interesting points that you've all raised. Um, I think it, you, know, you, you, you mentioned, Rodrigo, it's very difficult to compare countries. Um, and I think there are diff you know, difficult challenges um, among and between countries, um, as well as within countries. And so it is very difficult to look at this. But I think you know, one thing I think the global pandemic has taught us is that you know, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Um, so I, I guess I would um, turn to each of you a bit and to say, you know, if you had to if you had to focus on, and maybe Waka, I'll start with you from kind of a national, a global level, you know, if, you, if you had to, where, where, where are the solutions? Where, where do the solutions lie? If you had to focus on, on one area, um, there's many places to focus, but wh wh where do you think some of the solutions are? Is it within COVAX? Is it within national companies negotiating their own um, vaccine supply um, and distribution plans? Wafa, I'm going to ask you to. I think you're on mute, Wafa. Uh -oh. Okay. Technical difficulties. Okay. So maybe I'll turn <laughs> I'll turn I'll turn back to, to, to Sylvia or Roger. Maybe Sylvia if you want to comment. Um so uh one 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 issue I think is that um we uh, as Wafa has mentioned earlier, like it's not just vaccine. Vaccine is not just a magic bullet bullet. We need to make sure that the general public keeps doing what people have been talking since early in the pandemic. Continue wearing masks, washing hands, and social and social distancing. So that is also another issue, like another issue that I think happens, not happens in several other countries, but happens in Brazil. Like some um, some people like think that if they just took like already took one dose of the vaccine, they are free to do whatever they want in the in their lives. Or like n n last week was carnival, even though mo most of the major events were canceled, we still see in the news like uh, um, people that gather together for local festivities, uh, uh, secret parties, secret parties, uh, people gathering together. So Brazil still has. Uh, uh, Brazil has been on a streak of a uh, high number of cases for the last month or so ever since ever since the end of the year parties. So Christmas, New Year's, uh, it still has like more than a, a thousand deaths and more than a thousand deaths of COVID a year, a day. So we really need to focus on what we already know that helps disseminate the virus. And, and of course, like I also think like rich countries should like should also try to to help help middle income and, and middle income and low income countries in vac in, in vaccine access. Yeah. So uh, as we saw, like I think a few days ago, Biden pledged Biden mm -hmm. pledged to, to give funds like to give funds like to Covax and Novavax is going to give like more than 1 billion vaccine doses to to the COVAX initiative. So I think initiatives such as the such as these initiatives need to happen and fast. I'm back. Thank you, Wafa. I can, Good. I can, <laughs> apologies, uh, technical difficulties. I, I do think, you know, what's unique about this um, pandemic is that it, it really has affected all countries and probably some of the most severely affected countries have been the high income countries 
which is pretty unusual. And um, so if you look at um, a city like New York City, for example, it's been much more severely affected, impacted than people imagine in terms of the losses and, um, and deaths and suffering and so on. Um, and similarly, certain communities within high income countries have been totally devastated. So it's, it's, it's a funny thing because here you have a pandemic that's, uh, of course, it's affected uh, countries differentially, but it in some ways affected some of the richest countries in, in the worst manner possible. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex situation where obviously some of the leadership in these countries are thinking, you know, they need to control the epidemic. They need to do something to be able to address the, the losses and the suffering and so on. While at the same time, we have to also think about the inequities between countries. So I think it's very complicated. And I feel like uh, I always tell people it's a win-win because you even if we, it, it, no country is gonna be safe by just building walls around itself. This is a virus, it's gonna spread across borders and we know viruses don't respect borders. So in a way to protect the US, let's talk about the US, the US population, you need to protect the world's population because we're all interconnected. So it's in self-interest, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So I think that's a difficult um, narrative because there's a self-interest mm -hmm. because people have suffered, but at the same time, I think wealthy countries have a responsibility to give and support others. And like uh, Sylvia said, there's now the beginning of recognition with a commitment by wealthy countries to COVAX. I do think it's important though, um, Certainly Brazil has the infrastructure to be able to do vaccination. So it's a supply issue in, in Brazil. Is in, to a large extent, it's a supply. And once the supply is here, hopefully the vaccination machinery can be activated and be effective, I, I hope, I trust. I think there are other countries in the world where it's more than just supply. And it is the investment, not just in the procurement and the supply, but it is in all of these machinery that you need, the staffing, the communication, the vehicles, the refrigerators, the freezers, the vaccination program. So each country will have very different needs, Julie, uh, based on their, their own circumstances. And uh, I also find there are lots of lessons to be learned across borders. And certainly the US has not done very well, as we all know. <laughs> either in the response or in the vaccination. Uh, so we all kind of are learning from each other. And that's maybe been the silver lining with COVID-19 is that whether it be clinicians or researchers or public health people, uh, we're learning from each other and adjusting our programming to hopefully be able to get to where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. and, and identifying the lessons we want to take forward. Yep. Yeah. Rodrigo, did you want to make a comment? And then I have yes. a few questions from the audience that I want. Yeah, just complementing what 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 uh, Sylvan Martha said. I think I mean the 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 yeah. I think the understanding that actually vaccination is not gonna solve things overnight, right? And that we have to keep uh, keep at, at the at the uh, the effort of social distancing and 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 behaving, let's say, right? And I think in the case of Brazil, I mean, in an abstract world, if I was gonna, if I, I if I if I was gonna say like what would be the single issue that's relatively easy and that would have most impact probably would be a change in the in the in the political speech right and uh, mm -hmm. and I mean there's a lot of evidence now I think in the case of the U.S. with Trump in the case of Brazil with with Bolsonaro serious uh, research done showing how their speech actually indeed affected people's behavior and indeed affected the rate of transmission and, and rate of mortality right so I think this would be a, this would be a cheap thing to do, obviously, but it's not within our control, right? Because obviously it's not a policy variable that we can freely choose, right? So uh, so in terms of actually uh, a, a vaccination and the discussion of, uh, of, the, of the international uh, allocation, the problem of allocation of, of, of vaccines across the uh, different countries, I do think the international organizations should step up and really assume a leadership role in this discussion because obviously, as Wafa mentioned, there is a there is politically it there, it's very difficult for the, the countries to just give up right in the middle of the crisis, give up a certain share of the of, of the vaccines that they have given the level of scarcity that we're seeing mostly everywhere, right? So I think this is a type of situation 
where international organizations can actually work to reinforce these international agreements, right? And I don't think they have done that uh, really. Uh, by that, I mean the, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, in the case of Latin American Interna the Inter-American Development Bank, really to step up this, 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 this uh, discussion, uh, trying to rationalize the distribution across the different countries, right? But, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, there's a couple questions, I think, from the audience, um, I think Wafa probably best directed to you um, about what's happening in Brazil. And two, one, one about the variant um, and what we know um, about vaccines that might protect against the P1 variant that we're seeing in Brazil. Um, and uh, the other, I think also about some of the, the, it seems like there's some concerns about and vaccine hesitancy around the safety of the Chinese and Russian vaccines. Um, and maybe you could comment um, on both of those things. Yes, and I think it's it's really critical, um, you know, to step back and, and reflect that, you know, when 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 we were thinking ahead and thinking about what kind of a vaccine uh, would be important to have, um, at that time there was a, a most researchers said if we had a vaccine that was sixty percent effective, that would be well worth the effort, you know. So. So I think it's, and that was the, the threshold that was set by uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the US. So they wanted to look at data from any vaccine that at least achieves 60% uh, efficacy or effectiveness. So I think that the fact that there are some vaccines that are 94% and so on effective uh, is, is fantastic. But also keep in mind that these vaccines were studied at an earlier period of time when we did not have these variants. So that's really important to keep in mind. So I wonder if the Pfizer-BioNTech studies and the Moderna studies were done today, not a while ago, not last summer, but today, what would be their efficacy? Because the efficacy is dependent on, of course, the viruses that are circulating in the community. So I think you need to keep in mind that not, and this is like comparing apples and oranges, is when these studies were done. And the more recent studies are the ones that are facing these new variants. And that's why we see a little bit of a diminution uh, of, of efficacy. Nonetheless, when people ask me, they ask me, um, I'm being offered this vaccine. Should I take it or should I wait for whatever? I say, take it. <laughs> if you're offered the vaccine, because the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh the risks, number one, these have all been found to be safe. And number two, the benefits are so much better than the possible complications of COVID-19. I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. I do believe that companies are now working on developing new vaccines. So they're, they're using the same technologies and they're now developing vaccines against these new variants. Because a lot of the vaccines that are now available, they all were built on uh, the prototype uh, virus, which is the virus that was in Wuhan, you know, way back in China. That was the prototype virus. Now they're taking current viruses, including these variants, and developing these new vaccines. So it's possible that in the future, after this initial vaccination, there may be the need for a booster vaccine, for example, that would be one that was created to be effective against these new variants. So it's science is evolving, and we're going to learn along the way uh, but I do think that um, that um, I, that we should do whatever we can uh, to encourage people to be vaccinated uh, for the reasons that I that I mentioned and try to overcome their hesitancy in in a variety of different ways that probably vary from country to country and context to context. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Excellent. Um, I think I'm going to turn and see if we have uh, other questions. But I think Safwan, I'm going to turn to you. I want to thank our panelists. I know we lost. Um, Miguel, who had to run off and, and study, uh, teach students, but that's uh, more important, I think, than this. Um, but I want to thank each of you for, for your time, um, your energy, and your constant work um, on this um, public health situation, both globally and in, within Brazil. Um, and thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, Safwan, I'm going to turn over to you to close us thank out. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, leading this and for all the work that you do to try to bring um, some of this incredibly important knowledge to our students and to our audiences around the world. Thank you, Wafa. Thank you for always um, illuminating any conversation about this and for all the great work that you do at Colombia and in the world. And Silvia, Rodrigo, and Miguel in absentia can't thank you enough, really, for 
um, adding to the richness of this conversation and to its texture and to for bringing your expertise from Brazil. I think you know it's fair to say that the um, road ahead is still long, and uh, Wafa talked about the tunnel and our ability to walk into that, that tunnel and um, get to the end of it. But uh, there's a lot to be hopeful about in Brazil and around the world, and I think there's a lot uh, uh, to learn and, and build upon. And um, I think we're all very fortunate to have people like yourselves um, doing the great work uh, that you do. I also want to recognize and thank the Rio Global Center team, uh, Tom Trebat and his whole team for, uh, for organizing this and for um, making it happen. So thanks to our audience and thanks to all of you and uh, stay safe, stay healthy and um, continue to be upbeat. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.